welcome everyone for the episode three of how languages connect people here at day translations we live languages and people and how they can grow interact and evolve while using different languages as always our interviewer and host of the series ceo and founder of day translations inc sean patrick hopwood will be interviewing several people connected to languages and to the translation and interpreting world on our third episode we are speaking with valentina kiriko valentina is an archaeologist specialized in Egyptology and currently working as an online editor for a fashion company. She is passionate about her Egyptology and archaeology, modern and ancient languages, having in her curriculum English, French, German, Latin, Ancient Greek, Etruscan, and Middle Egyptian. Very nice to have you with us, Valentina. And I'm going to pass on to our host. Thank you very much, Valentina. It's very nice to have you on here. Um, I'm the president of Day Translations. I, I have this podcast to talk about uh, language, linguistics, and um, speak to people who fascinate me. Uh, I'm really fascinated with languages and cultures, and um, I would like—I just like to know more about you. So, welcome to the show. Hello, Sean. Thank you for having me uh, here with you today. Um, I'm Valentina. I'm originally from uh, Italy. I uh, lived for a while in Birmingham, West Midlands, and I moved to, to London quite recently for some life experience and work experience. So um, I've been studying languages at school, and uh, then I put that into practice. This is why I'm here. And uh, yes, uh, I studied Egyptology and also worked uh, in, uh, in the field as an archaeologist when I was back in Italy. Wonderful. So you are originally from Italy? Yes, correct, to south, southern Italy. Oh, okay, that's, that's great. And what is the difference? Well, I, I, I can talk about language forever. <laughs> um, the, something that originally uh, just came to my head. What is the difference between the way they speak uh, Italian and where you're from and where they speak in the north or the middle? Well, everyone says that um, we speak pretty fast, and I think probably from um, in the south of Italy, people speak faster. But it's more like a difference in the in the accent. And uh, the funny thing is that we have so many different uh, dialects. Uh, so Italian is really variegated because we have different different dialects. So you uh, you can tell where people are from from the the dialect. So. Um, yeah, it's more like when you you are there, you will realize uh, who comes from the north, who from the south. Mainly people will think that uh, from the south are those that speak louder, faster, and they are more friendly or warmer. Somehow it's true, but also people from the north are really, really friendly. So yeah. that sounds good. <laughs> That's really nice. And I, I think, um, you know, a lot of people, every single country has its dialects. And a lot of people don't realize that Italy has so many dialects as well, you know, from Naples, from Roma, and, you know, from the north, you know, all these different places has, they all have their own little dialect. And it's really cool to see that that, that happens in Italy as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how many languages do you speak? I currently speak Italian and English because I've been using them for quite a long time. But uh, at school, at the university, I learned so many uh, modern and ancient languages. So at school, I studied uh, French and German. At home, I tried to uh, learn a little bit of Spanish, Castellano, because my grandparents moved to Venezuela after the war. And then uh, at the university, I studied uh, Latin, uh, ancient uh, Greece, uh, Greek, uh, then uh, Etruscan and uh, Middle Egyptian. Middle, what is the last one? Middle Egyptian. Which Middle is, Egyptian. Uh, yes, because basically the Egyptian language uh, evolved through time, but um, what we study at the university is a sort of, it's like the equivalent of classic Latin that we study at school. So Middle Egyptian is the classic part of the uh, Egyptian language. That's interesting. This is also interesting. Um, I personally, I've been to an Egyptian Coptic church. Um, mm -hmm. Is this the language they speak at Coptic churches or is it more ancient or, or do you know about that? So basically, uh, Coptic is the, really the last uh, step of the, of the Egyptian language. And so they, uh, they, mm, and they, in the language itself use a different sort of script. Um, so, 
So basically from the Coptic, we still have pieces of uh, ancient Egyptian, which makes things so intriguing. It's intriguing. Have, have you been to, uh, have you spoken to people in, uh, in the Coptic language or have you had you know, discussions with them? Uh, no, I just met uh, an Egyptian uh, girl so far. But, um, so she was uh, speaking more languages and uh, her language was the uh, Egyptian dialect of uh, Arabic. So it was Arabic with like the Egyptian mm -hmm. kind of uh, dialect. But so far nobody that was like uh, an Egyptian Coptic or like, I mean, a yeah. Christian Coptic, for example. Yeah, actually, one of my best friends is—he's actually a Egyptian Coptic, and um, it's 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 pretty fascinating. Like he speaks mostly just—he speaks mostly Arabic, but um, he knows a little bit of that too. And I, and uh, yeah, we have a Coptic church right down the road from where I live, oh. and they have the service in English, Arabic, and Coptic, and <laughs> it makes it it makes the service last a really long time. Um, but it's very it's very interesting as a linguist. It's just, it's fascinating. But I mean, I don't know, I, I guess that, uh, you know, Middle Egyptian is a lot, is a lot different, but it's still interesting to learn. <laughs> um, so, and the, so you also speak Etruscan, Ancient Greek and Latin? So it's more like more than speaking. Uh, I learned them uh, at school, so oh, I yeah. being able to read inscription or being able to translate them. Oh, that's, that's really, that's really cool. And so, um, like I speak to people all around the world, specifically, uh, you know, you speak to, if you speak to someone in China, you know, something that interests them, they, they're interested in English, they're interested in French a lot, but they're not so, um, uh, not a lot, well, some of them are, but not so interested in uh, Spanish or other languages like that. And you see like where you're from really kind of shapes, you know, a little bit of what your interests are too, because Etruscan, uh, that's ancient, like Italian, right? From like, that's, that, that was, well, maybe you can explain better than I, than I can, because I really don't know much about it. So basically, uh, Etruscan is a very, very uh, old uh, uh, language in the uh, in Italian peninsula. And some uh, Latin historians thought that uh, it was uh, an autochthonous uh, language, because if we think about all the languages uh, spoken uh, in uh, Europe at the time, uh, the Etruscan used, uh, used a very, very different um uh, alphabet, so it's, it reminds a little bit of um, uh, some inscription found um, in um, you know the Aegean uh, island, Aegean, but it was okay. a bit, yes, mm. um, but it was complete. It was like differently written, but compared to Latin, and it was older than Latin uh, itself. So already uh, in a classical time, the historians knew that there was something peculiar and something awkward uh, regarding the Etruscans. They were like a sort of unicum, like something unique in the peninsula. Very nice. Very interesting, yeah. It's interesting. Um, we think about how quickly our language changes. Like, for example, English, the amount of slang that is produced every year is a lot. And these these societies they last hundreds and hundreds of years so the amount of linguistic you know information the amount of historical information you can get by just studying one of these languages is, is probably amazing um so are you working now as a as an archaeologist or what is what is your main focus so at the moment uh, i'm working part-time as a fashion editor but um, i love one day to be back to my field and uh, combining my passion for archaeology uh, and uh, um, writing and uh, beauty so in fact my spare time also manage uh, my own website but my my, re my dream would be um, being able to write about beauty in uh, antiquity and in ancient egypt which was the subject of my dissertation so at the moment I'm doing a small job, but that, that will be my aim for the future. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing you're interested in archaeology, but you also do your fashion blogging. Is it? Mm, uh, yes. Or, yes. Uh, it's ValentinaKiriko.com, right? Yes, that's my uh, personal website, and then uh, I'm now working also for our fashion uh, company. Okay. So I'm doing more things at once, but that's my personal website. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Yeah, you 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 have to balance kind of modern modernity with ancient things at the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah. yeah, and what do you what do you like more? Like, do you prefer uh, modernity or do you prefer to study history and archaeology? Well, 
recently I was thinking about and uh, still a big passion of mine is uh, antiquity. So I really, really miss studying my subject. Um, but sometimes it's funny. I was thinking about some uh, jewelry uh, in ancient Egypt that I saw um, at the Petrie Museum here in London. And they look so so modern. It looks like uh, some, uh, uh, you know, collar or, you know, those uh, necklaces full of colorful yeah. beads. So sometimes uh, the ancient look really modern or probably we are like like the ancient. <laughs> we yeah. look like the ancient. Like there are things that we keep loving like our ancestors. Yeah, yeah some things are, are just timeless. Some things mm -hmm. that were built a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago and they still work just as fine today, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old a fork is, but I don't think you can really improve upon a fork. You know, <laughs> I, they've probably been using that for thousands of years, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 really interesting. Um, what do you feel about, do you feel like there's anything really like lost when you lose a language like Etruscan or ancient Greek? Um, and how important do you think it is to preserve these languages? Well, when uh, when a language is really close to, to die or is dead, uh, it's a big loss because it's not just the language itself and the sound of the language, but it's also the culture, the people. So when we read or try to read something in a Etruscan, for example, we just have an idea of the sound, but probably it wasn't the sound of the, the ancient Etruscan speaking that yeah. language. But most of all, and the thing that I'm most interesting, uh, interested in uh, archaeology is the the ancient people. So, and this is the same thing that may happen today when there are those small group of people sparse, I don't know, in Africa or in Amazon or in Asia, um, speaking a unique form of dialect. When nobody's going to speak that uh, dialect, that the world, not just the language, the, the whole society is going to die. This is really sad. And this is what happened in the past. So um, this is the sad part about the death of the language. It's what's around, what make it up, the language, which is... Yeah. yeah, and I believe that death of a language can also kind of equate to the death of a society. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you, when you keep your language strong, you know, you, and and you keep improving it, your you know your society changes. And I know that, that um, a couple of you know countries and societies have a preservation of language institute. I believe there's you know, the, in Spain there's the Real Academia Española. The, in um, France there's a preservation of the language. There's um, in in German there's a Goethe Institute, I believe, right? Um, and so yeah, the preservation of languages, preservation of culture in a very in an interesting way. Um, so that's that's really interesting. So um, you chose to leave Italy and do your master's in the United Kingdom. Uh, what is the, what, why did you do that, and what um, what benefits has it had for you? Well, uh, the benefits are quite material. I mean, something that you see in daily life. Uh, in fact, um, the UK allowed me to work and study at the same time. Um, but I still, uh, today, I really, really miss what I left in Italy because in Italy I had lots of amenities. I have uh, centuries and centuries of cultures. I have a good life, especially I, I had archaeology all around me. But unfortunately, there wasn't enough job. There aren't jobs for, for students or for young people. This is why I had to, to move uh, to the UK. So let's say that I moved to uh, keep studying and uh, working and living and uh, build my future. Yeah. So would you say that um, England kind of, uh, well, it's, it's interesting because Europe has such ancient culture. Do you think um, in, uh, Europe in England, they embrace modernity a little bit more and Italy, Italy they kind of embrace uh, antiquity and culture more? Um, at different degrees, because I have to say, here in the UK, I was able to see that when there are like a small, um, you know, small heritage sites, they are actually really, really uh, well kept and they actually use that place as a sort of touristic attractors. Yeah. So let's say, even though the UK is like, is rocketing toward uh, the future, um, especially the smaller community take really, really care of their antiquities. I thought they are not really the ancient like what we found in Italy. In Italy, instead, we try to balance also because um, 
the ancient past is all around us. I mean, uh, every time there's like a new construction or a meter going on, the new uh, uh, new things going on. I mean, uh, there are more uh, discoveries. So let's say that uh, Italy is like between the modern and past. So it tries to combine both. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, it's very important to kind of like you know hold on and understand you know understand your past and not get rid of it too quickly because you know you have to continue, you have to know where you came from. So um, yeah, where I'm from, I live in Florida in the United States, and there's not a lot of history here compared to places like Italy and the United Kingdom. And the only thing we really have is a place called Saint Augustine which is the oldest, I believe it's the oldest city in the United States. And you can go there and you can see ancient forts and stuff like that. But still, it's only a couple hundred years old compared to, you know, the ancient history that you have in um, in uh, Italy. So it's pretty interesting. Um, so you're doing your, uh, have you completed your master's degree? Yes, in 2019. Oh, okay. And uh, you also work as a translator. Um, is that true? Uh, yes, especially now at the moment, particularly as a transcriber. So, and it's even more interesting and intriguing because it's a massive challenge because uh, transcribe a text means that while I listen to an audio, I have to type as fast as possible the uh, the uh, my version. Like if I hear uh, an Italian person, I have to like transcribe it. Uh, in English, so it's a sort of extra challenge for my brain, but it's quite um, it's quite surprising how the brain evolves so quickly and adapts. Our brain is really powerful, I think. Oh yeah! So you do live transcription, like you don't do it later. You do it live as as they're speaking. Um, I usually I try to do that because uh, it's it's basically. Um, it's not like uh, live. It's like um, a project that I have to present. So yeah. I don't have time to like uh, listen again. But of course, there are deadlines. Deadlines are really important. So uh, one has to master the job. So you have to be able to uh, transcribe as you listen. That's the trick. Yeah. And have you done interpretation as well? Yeah, I tried, but uh, it was during the, the university, so I just had uh, an experience and then I had to, to move on. I mean, um, interpreting is even harder because you may deal with situations that are quite uncomfortable or like quite sensitive. So it's a very, very uh, difficult job, I think, because sometimes you may be called, for example, in a house where a police is, uh, is there to, yeah. you know, record a story or like you have to go to an hospital or a jeep or to a gp so let's say that that's more it's a more delicate job honestly oh yeah interpretation is weird also when you're the interpreter it's interesting because you're just trying to say everything that the the client is saying and if you say something rude they, they look at you like you said something rude <laughs> i'm like i didn't say it they, i'm just interpreting what they said yeah, and exactly. like, you, you second guess yourself, like, should I say this? And I'm like, of course you should say this. You, you're just interpreting. Mm -hmm. And then and then sometimes the, um, the the people who don't really understand what's going on, you're just interpreting for them. They look at you like, what is it? Why are you saying this? <laughs> it's so weird. Yeah, but it's interesting. So um, what kind of um, um, effect did your family have on you wanting to learn all these languages? Because I think it's interesting. You really focus on... Uh, ancient languages and for me I speak a few languages and I kind of focus on practical languages that I can use now in business and so um, what 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 led you more towards the ancient languages and and how did your family uh, have an effect on that I think um, having um, a portion of my family uh, speaking other languages also listening to them or the phone uh, spark of my interest since uh, my childhood. So I've been always attracted by everything that sounds familiar but not quite, and everything that stands at the boundaries of um, the everyday. So I've been attracted by uh, different languages that sound strange, but especially uh, languages that are written with different, let's say, alphabets, but let's yeah. say uh, different systems. So I think thanks to my family, I became more and more interested uh, in foreign languages and foreign cultures. 
Oh yeah, um, alphabets are interesting. Oh, go ahead. What were you gonna say? Yeah, but for both unseen, uh, unseen languages, is that I was so curious since a child that I started to see too many documentaries. This is how the passion for Egypt uh, started. Honestly, it was documentaries. Yeah, it's fascinating, and I need to learn more about writing as well. I was studying a little bit about writing between uh, Chinese. I'm studying Chinese right now. I have my mm -hmm. little um, Chinese <laughs> cards here, and uh, you look at the language. And it's very uh, smooth, like it flows a lot, you know, because they they started their language using, uh, I guess, um, a feather or ink, you know. And then mm -hmm. somewhere in places, Nordic countries, they used uh, chisel into stone. So their, lang their letters are very angular. And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of letters because it's hard to write a lot of letters in, with a chisel, you know. In Chinese, there's like 50,000 characters. So... It's very fascinating to see. I, I'm not sure about the case with uh, the, the Italian peninsula and Etruscan and, uh, and stuff like that and Greek, but um, I know that language kind of evolves from the materials you have available at the time. And so, yeah, how um, how did that how does that work with uh, with Egypt? How how is their writing like in Middle Egypt? What well, Middle Egyptian? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's say the uh, Egyptian and also the, um, the language itself was written uh, with different uh, scripts, depending also on uh, what was the, the um, you know, why the text was written. So, uh, so let's say what we see uh, in a in a in a uh, uh, set on in stone, for example, on walls or like statues. This hieroglyph and it's mainly for that purpose. But then there were a uh, faster way of writing. So we have, for example, the erratic uh, that was used for, uh, it was the um, system used for, you know, bureaucratic papers. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the demotic that was for daily use, but not uh, everyone in Egypt was able to, to write uh, still for, you know, every day, like letters what that was used. What are those two last ones called? Erratic and what? Uh, yeah, erratic um, is because, like, um, in fact, if you see, sometimes if you see um, the different form of the Egyptian language, sometimes you can see how um, a, a, a symbol, a hieroglyph, uh, looks like as written with the, the, the erratic form and then in the motic. So um, it depends on uh, why the text was written. So Okay. It was also adapting to the, you know, the the me, uh, medium that says to the surface and what you used to write in so for example, yeah. it'll be mainly for, uh, you know, um, epigraphy, like on, on stones, I mean. Yeah, and the, yeah, the medium that you have makes a big difference. Yeah. If you have a scroll with ink, you can write so yeah. fa much faster. And yes, if you have, you have stone and a chisel, it's going to take you forever, so... Yeah. But it, stone and chisel lasts a lot longer. <laughs> so that's why that, I think maybe they knew that and they wanted their culture to last a long time and people to come back and see it later. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they knew that. That's why they, they a lot of hieroglyphs are chiseled into stone. And that's that's pretty it's pretty interesting. I, I could go on. I love talking about these things. Anything to do with language, I love. But outside of um languages what what do you do well it could be with languages if you'd like to do it with your free time but what do you like to do with your free time and what, well, what are the things you do? like in my spare time well uh when i was in italy i was used to ride uh, my bike a lot or cycling a lot and go to the beach these are things that i'm not doing anymore so like i cycle when i have to go somewhere so in my spare time i, I read i listen to music i watch videos i do yoga and uh and i write my my blogs and sometimes i go out for walks and uh visit places because i'm really curious i like discovering new places in, uh, in my new city so this is how i spend my time maybe. yeah and you feel comfortable just uh relocating to new cities it's, for me it's kind of hard to leave my comfort zone <laughs> Um, the, the main problem for me is mainly how to move my, my stuff because I have <laughs> lots of books and, uh, you know, material stuff. One day it's going to be material culture. This. But, um, I feel quite comfortable because I realize that if I do not move, I, I will have a lack, 
uh, of experiences. There's going yeah. to be a big hole that I have to 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 fill anyway. So uh, um, I realized that every time that I step outside of my comfort zone, I may be able to do something that one day is going to feel so extraordinary. Sometimes I think, oh, okay, I'm in London now. It's normal, but no, it's not. It's a massive change for a god that was living in a small city in uh, in Italy yeah. uh, like four years ago. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating to to go and travel and see new things. I want to start traveling more. I do travel a lot within the United States right now, but I used to travel a lot. I traveled through Europe and Africa and South America, but um, the experiences you get are amazing. And I don't know if you're like me, but I'm not all about. I don't need to see the you know the London Eye or the Eiffel Tower or the Buckingham Palace. I I want to see the people. I want to talk to the people, and that's the most amazing part about traveling. And you see the different types of people, especially in London, where it's so diverse and you have people from all around. They're all bringing their cultures to the city. It's like, it's amazing, you know, in, in places like Paris or, you know, uh, Dubai, all these places they have in Shanghai, they have different cultures coming together and mixing and you, and you get to learn from them. It's, it's beautiful. So, yeah. So um, regarding your languages, what is your favorite word in Etruscan, Greek, and, uh, and, and Middle Egyptian? What are your favorite words? I'm going to write oh, Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have to dig a little bit my memories. So uh, for Wokons in Etruscan, uh, we have a really small uh, dictionary of Etruscan because we have fewer, uh, you know, uh, test survive so far, but um, they are mainly from barrios of or from uh, cult centers. So our, uh, you know, Etruscan uh, uh, dictionary or lexicon is really short. So basically, the the word that I love, uh, there are two actually. I really like um, uh, thesan, which is dawn, but or morning, but it's also you spell that? thesan. T e s a n. S a n. Yes. Okay. Which is uh, morning or dawn, but it's also the goddess of the dawn. Uh, and then this, this is this sounds so funny to me. I don't know you, but I love fulfuns, which is Fulfuns? the god of wine. God of wine. <laughs> so funny. Like How do you spell Fulfuns. that one? Uh, F U F L U N S. Fufus. Fufuns. Okay. F U F L U N. <laughs> okay. Got it. That's not. Yes. What does that mean? Wine, the god of wine. Uh, god of wine is the god of wine. The name of the god of wine. Um, then uh, in uh, in Greek, in ancient Greek, I like agape, which is uh, the unconditional love. I mean, it's love. So it's a really simple word, but it's got a big meaning. Uh, then uh, in Latin, instead, I like uh, a sort of motto way of saying. Uh, which is per aspera ad astra. We can also find it as ed ad astra per aspera, yeah. which, which means to the star uh, through uh, um, ships. <laughs> so in my university uh, took inspiration from that to have his motto, which is per adua ad astra. Uh, okay. Then uh, um, from Middle Egyptian, I like the verb sang, um, which means uh, to make alive, to cause to live. Okay. Um, so, and actually, it's like, I think it's a, a, this sort of verb actually have some sort of hope because everyone would like to live forever. And uh, actually, uh, Egyptian had a fixation for that. So also all the inscription, all the name set in stone, it was for that, to make the, uh, the name and the person live forever. That's interesting. So does the Egyptian, um, their language have more, uh, have a Greek influence or Arabic influence? So what is the more, more influence in ancient and Middle Egyptian? Um, I, I just I heard about Cleopatra. I, I just, uh, she's from uh, Greece, right? Cleopatra is Greek. So basically it's more like, uh, you know, uh, Egyptian is also older than, uh, in, than Greek. I mean, it's more right. like, um, let's say that I don't know how much of the language has passed uh, to the modern times. I think just a little bit connected with the uh, with the Coptic 
uh, and the yeah. Catholic Coptic has something to do with the the um, with the actual Middle Egyptian. Yeah. So. So this is come. It's way before that, and it's kind of like yeah. it's way established way before mm-hmm. that. Okay, that's interesting to learn for me. <laughs> that's that's beautiful. So, what what are your goals uh, in the future? Uh, you want to improve your language skills. Uh, you want to work in archaeology. What are your goals? Uh, for what concerns languages, uh, I'm curious. So I'd love to listen to more people speaking the language. Especially, I'm really curious about Korean. It's the sound that I really like. Korean. Yeah, because sometimes I had um, I was watching some videos and I do like the sound of this language, so I'm yeah. really intrigued by that. Uh, then uh, um, I will keep practicing my Middle Egyptian because otherwise I get really really rusty. For work on work, work, uh, I absolutely want to find a full time job that really fulfills myself. And if it's connected with archaeology and uh, writing, it will be better because. My dream would be that uh, making uh, the ancient past available f- with, for everyone through, you know, uh, media works and uh, writing. That's a beautiful statement, making the ancient past available for everyone. I love that. <laughs> um, I'm very interested in linguistic archaeology myself, uh, you know, and you can do, there's probably a whole, you know, branch of archaeology, just linguistic archaeology. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something I'm interested in. At, at Day Translations, uh, we have worked on ancient languages. We have spent months like investigating languages and the re- and like we did one with ancient Burmese uh, a couple of months ago. We've done ancient Ottoman language. I mean, this is this is something I love too. So it's really it's really wonderful and rewarding for me to speak to you about this because I'm the same way. And when you say that you like a language just because of the way it sounds, I feel the same way. Uh, it, 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 just the way it sounds and I can even listen to a language that I don't understand I can watch an entire movie from a, a language I don't understand and I can kind of even understand it in a way because I understand the intonations and the way they're expressing themselves and it's even more beautiful in a way because when you don't understand the language you can kind of look at the subtext and you can look at the um, the way they react and the body movement it's, it's really beautiful because body movement is a language too <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to uh, to add or talk about? Um, no. If you have any other <laughs> question, I'm open to talk because we Italians <laughs> we speak a lot, also fast. So, if you ask me something, I will keep talking, talking, talking. <laughs> <you know>. Well, <laughs> I love to listen. I could talk forever about these languages, especially I don't know a lot about Etruscan or Middle Egyptian or Greek or any of these languages. So it's it's beautiful and it's wonderful to talk to you. So. For everyone listening, you know, um, her website is uh, Valentina Chirico, uh, C-H-I-R-I-C-O is the last name. And um, I just, uh, you know, I wish you a lot of success in learning your languages and and learning about archaeology and stuff like that. So thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me because this is something that I love. I love talking about. Thank you, Sean. Yes, thank you, Alejandro, for this opportunity. I really enjoyed this chat with you. I really enjoyed it as well, much. and I hope Thank that you. the readers can like. I know you're like an expert in these subjects, and we talked we touched a little bit on this on a little things, but I hope it can open their minds to where they can start researching everything you started talking about because it's really beautiful. Thank you. Hope so. Okay. Thank you, Valentin. It was really really interesting um, hearing about your your experience. Hopefully, we will see you soon. Hope yeah. so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Valentina, and see you on the next episode. All right. See you all on the next episode. Bye. Bye.